The Gospel according to St. Mark. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on him, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Holly James Haney, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Receive the sign of the cross on the head and on the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ, the crucified. The Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has given you new birth of water and the Spirit and has forgiven all your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Let us pray. We give thanks, O most merciful Father, that you have received Holly as your own child and made her a member of Christ's body and the church. Now we pray, grant to her and to all your church on earth that being dead in sin, we may live into righteousness and being buried with Christ into his death, we may also share in his resurrection so that we we may inherit eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loves his people and calls them to his own, no matter if it's a little child, or an adult, he calls us to say, follow me, and by faith we follow him. Amen. Picture this scenario. There's a family that has a group of tickets to go to a big game or a show, but one of the people is unable to go. And so they have to find someone to you know, give this ticket to so that they could come with. So they start thinking and thinking, and they think of you. They, they, they pick up their phone and start texting you and calling you, but you're not picking up. They could easily stop there. They could go and find other people. But they get in their car instead and go to your house. They knock on your door. You answer the door, and they say, Hey, I have a ticket to the big game tonight or, or the show. Would you like to go? And you think to yourself, this is a wonderful opportunity. This is a great gift. And you say yes, because you know that you might not have another opportunity like it. You, know, you understand their kindness in what they're doing. Today we get to hear Jesus come to us and invite us, and not to a game, but to follow him. And what a blessing it is in his kindness and grace, despite us or despite the pastor or anyone. He calls you. He calls me, he calls us by, by grace, with his kindness. When you kind of jump into the gospel readings, you kind of wonder, in a certain sense, you know, where, you know, where this all is in Jesus' ministry. And so you, you think, okay, where are we in Jesus' ministry? As we open up to our reading from John chapter 1, you'd say, probably not very far, we're in chapter, tw- chapter 1, and you'd be correct. You know, you think about the, 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 the aspect of Jesus' ministry. He hadn't changed water into wine. He, he hadn't done a, a gathering of all of his disciples. He's just gathered a few, Andrew, Simon, and Simon Peter. You know, Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry, and what does that look like? We, we hear that he takes these gentlemen and he goes to Galilee. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. If you can visualize where Galilee is, you have the Mediterranean Sea off to your left-hand side. 
you have the Dead Sea down below, and you have the Jordan River going all the way up, and you have the, the Sea of Galilee at the top. And the region to the left is all of Galilee. A lot of Jesus' ministry happens in this area. And so we see the disciples go, but Jesus has an intention when he's there. We hear, Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Could, could you imagine being Philip? You know, here is a, a, a man that Jesus was looking for, actively searching, and he wanted to find him. And what does he say to him? He says, follow me. You know, this is coming from the words of Jesus himself. But you kind of wonder, did Philip know about Jesus at all? We, do, we are told this, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So did Andrew and Peter give Philip a heads up? You know, did they let them know, you know, hey, you know, we're on our way. You know, we got this Jesus guy. You know, was this the first time that they had interaction with him? Well, we're not really told what or how that all happened. But we're just simply told that Jesus tried to find Philip and did and said, follow me. You know, you could kind of think from Philip's standpoint, what would you be thinking? You know, here's this man that you've never met before, and he's saying, come follow me. You know, follow me wherever I go, you will go. You will learn from me. I am the Messiah. I am the Lord. I am the one who was promised from Moses and Isaiah and all those prophets of long ago that would come to save people from their sins. Certainly it would be a lot for Philip to take in and kind of ponder. You know, there was nothing in Philip himself that made him special for this special task. There was nothing in him that made him uh, superior to any of the rest. It was simply by God's grace and mercy that he calls Philip. Now, you can imagine, you know, being Philip and being called by the Lord, the Savior of the universe, the God who created all things. And there he came to you, and how overjoyed you would be, right? You know, I think about the introduction of, like, the big game. If I got a, a pair of tickets, what would I do? I'd probably start texting my, my family and say, you know, guess where I'm going, you know, guess what I get to see? Guess what I get to do? You know, could you picture Philip, you know, kind of texting his buddies, so to speak, and doing that? Obviously, they didn't have texting, but he did the next best thing and went to his buddy Nathaniel and told him what he had found. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. If you were Nathaniel, and you're kind of thinking through this for yourself too, you have your, your buddy Philip, who you've maybe grown up with your whole life, and he's telling you, we have seen the Savior, we have seen the Messiah, and he's told us to follow him, and he's from Nazareth. You know, he's, he's thinking to himself, really? You know, the Savior is here, the Lord is here, you know, how could he possibly be here now? We've been waiting for thousands and thousands of years for him. Is he really here? You kind of get into the mind of Nathaniel when he says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked, come and see, said Philip. Nathaniel was thinking through things, and he was thinking, okay, Jesus had to come from Bethlehem, as was mentioned with the Magi we heard last week. No, why Nazareth? That's a know-nothing town. No one knows really anything about that. Nothing good comes from there. Now, how could the Savior be from there? But what does Philip do? Does he come up with this long debate? Does he try to prove his point? No, he simply says what? Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Let the Word speak for itself. Let Jesus speak for himself. Let Jesus be the proof that, that you need. You know, I, I don't need to defend it in a certain sense. You, know, you, you can see it for yourself. That's going to be proof. And so you could picture Philip and Nathaniel walking towards Jesus and where he was, and you could picture Philip going, that's him, that's him. 
That's Jesus I was telling you about. Right? And then on the other side, Jesus is seeing them come, and he says what? When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. You know, at first it seems like a big statement, doesn't it? You know, especially coming from Jesus to a sinful human being. Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How could this statement be true? Well, Jesus can A, see into the heart of God's people and see faith. Nathaniel was an Old Testament believer who trusted the words of the prophets that the Savior would come to save him from his sins. This is what he trusted in. This is what his faith was founded on. And Jesus could see that. And that faith was saving faith even though Jesus didn't die on the cross yet. You know, the Old Testament believers were saved through faith in Jesus, the one who would come. Where for us, we have faith in Jesus who did come and saved us. And so Nathaniel is kind of thinking to himself, you know, how, how do you know this, right? You know, how do you know me, Nathaniel asked. You know, it, it's an honest question, right? I just met you, Jesus. How do you know my heart? How do you know my life? How do you know any of this? You know, this is the first time I've met you. But Jesus being Jesus, Jesus being God, knows all things. And certainly he, he, he proves it by this. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus proved he certainly did not. He did know in what happened to Nathaniel. Jesus knew before Philip even came to Nathaniel under that tree where he was and what was going on. God knows all things. He knows where we've been. He knows where we're going. He knows what we're doing now. He knows what we're thinking. No. This could be quite terrifying, but it could also be comforting because God knows who we are. He knows who we are by grace and faith. And this obviously was shocking to Nathaniel. You know, how, how can you know this, right? He declares that he is the Son of God, the King of Israel. Lord, you, you have proven this to me. And then Jesus goes on. Jesus said, you believe because I told you. I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You know, Jesus is emphasizing who he is. By grace and mercy you will be saved. You will see the Son of Man uh, descending from heaven itself. You will see the, the Lord's glory and might one day, if it be that last day. You know, Jesus is essentially laying all this out for him to see, yes, he is the Savior. He is the one that was promised. He is the one that, that Philip told him about. You know, you, do you ever think of Jesus actively looking for you? You know, Jesus was actively looking for Philip, and he was looking for Nathaniel as he's brought here. He had his eyes on him. But do you ever picture Jesus actively looking for you? It might not be the face of Jesus, per se, that is before you, like Philip and Nathaniel experience. But maybe it's the face of a pastor. Maybe it's the face of a, a parent. Maybe it's a, a face of a friend or a Christian uh, brother or sister in the Lord that, that shows that gospel message to you no matter how flawed and sinful and imperfect they may be. You know, why would Jesus want to look for us? Why would he want to find us? I don't know why he would want to find me. I don't know why he would want to look for me. I have so many struggles in my own life, so many flaws, so many mistakes, so many failures, so many 
inadequacies. Why would Jesus want to find me? It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. Maybe you understand that too. As you look at your own life, you see all the same things that I see in myself. You wonder, why, why, are, why are you even in church today? No, why, why are you a believer? Why, why are you saved by grace alone? Because it's just that. It's grace. We don't deserve God's mercy or, or anything. God knows the inner workings of my head and my mind and the things that I dwell on, the things that I worry about, the, and all of that. And he knows all that for you too. But he still searches and looks for you as a lost child of his. He wants to bring you back. He wants to save you. He doesn't want you to perish in eternity in hell. He wants to save you. And that's what God does best. What grace it is that Jesus looks for you. No matter who you are, no matter your age, no matter the, your walk of life, no matter where you've been, Jesus loves you. He loves you enough to go wandering in the world and, and suffer infliction and pain and suffering and temptation for you. But he persevered through it all so that you could be saved. So that you could have mercy through his life, death, and resurrection. You know, I think it's amazing that, you know, Jesus calls these no-name men to follow him. To, to work alongside him, to, to serve in the ministry with him. By his grace and mercy, that is kindness. It's amazing to see this all unfold. It really is. And it puts things into perspective. You know, maybe you kind of wonder to yourself and think, you know, when you have to share God's word, do you think it's easy? Or do you think it's challenging? I think so often we think it's challenging. But what does Philip do when Nathaniel is questioning it? What does he say? Come and see. That's it. You know Come and see the word. Come and see your God. Come and see what he has done for you. I am going to let the Lord do the work. I am going to let the, the Savior of the universe work in your hearts through the, the, the word of God and through the Holy Spirit to create faith in your heart. Despite who is standing up in front or who's in the pew, uh, you know, God's word is at work through his baptism despite the individual administering it. It is the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit working in their heart. Well, what a comfort that is. What a reassurance that is. That we just can, can say, you know, to a certain degree, you know, come and see. Come to church. Come and see your Lord. Come and see your Savior. We can say, yes, you're sin you are a sinner, but so am I. Yes, you are a sinner, but Jesus died for us. You know, so often we put this pressure on ourselves to think that everything falls on us. That God's kingdom falls on me. That if I don't stand, God's kingdom will fall apart. But it won't. We are just spokesmen. We are servants. We are those who, who serve the Lord by His grace and mercy. There's a thing that sometimes... As a pastor, you have days on a Sunday or a Thursday and you get done even in the middle of a sermon or in the middle of a service or whatever it is, you think, man, that was not a good one. You know, that, that didn't really come out the way I wanted it to. I wish I could take that one back. You know, I wish I could redo it. I wrote it a lot better than it came out. But you, you think of that mindset, where's the focus? You know, it depends on me. And then without fail, I, I, I get to the back of the church, I'm shaking hands, and I'm just thinking, boy, what an idiot, what an idiot. 
and someone shakes my hand and says, Pastor, that's exactly what I needed today. I needed to hear that word. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Did you hear the same sermon I did? But it's not us. It's God. It's his word. He's the one who's working through sinful people. He's the one working through us to, to create his grace and mercy. And the same is true for you. Maybe you've experienced that too, where you said to yourself, boy, I wish I could have said that differently. I wish I could get another chance. Maybe you will. Take advantage of that opportunity. Just say, come and see. Come and see your Savior who died for you. Come and see the Savior who lives for you. What a blessing you have as family, as friends, as parents to encourage people and children in God's walk of faith and life that you can say, hey, this is my child that I want to be part of your family. This is the child that I, I want you to save by the grace and mercy of your Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus who died for us. This is your grace that is for us. You know, it's as simple as that. A pouring of water, saying the word, here it is. And instilling this truth in them at home through prayers and all of that. I mean, it doesn't have to be that difficult. I think I've shared this before, what we do at home. And I've shared this with a few other people. Again, before our kids go to bed, we say, you know, you are loved. And then we say, you know, who does daddy love? Levi, or Aiden, or Titus, right? And then who do, who do those people love? Dad, mom. And then who do dad and, and the boys love and mom love? Jesus. Who does Jesus love? Us, or like Aiden likes to say, all of us. Does it really have to be too challenging? Does it have to be difficult? No. This constant reminder, Jesus in his kindness and mercy loves us and calls us to follow him and to serve him. Amen. Please stand.